Welcome back to another Binary Ninja Basics. This episode, we're going to talk about plugins, using them as a user and writing them as a plugin author. As a user, there's a couple different ways you can get plugins to work. First, right from within Binary Ninja itself, if you hit Control Shift M or Command Shift M, depending on whether you're on Mac, Linux, or Windows, you're going to get the plugin manager. And within the plugin manager, you can see a large list of plugins, include some from the community, some from the Vector35, like official plugins. In fact, we can even search those. So I can type community and see all the community plugins. I can type official and see all the official plugins. I can even see ones just that I've enabled by typing enabled, right? And so that's gonna let me see and manage all of my existing plugins. Installing a new plugin is super easy. You click the plugin, you click the install button, and the first time you do this, you're gonna get a warning if it's a community plugin, but you can always ignore it and let it continue. You can also just click enable, which will both install and enable it right from the beginning. Some plugins you're gonna to wanna to restart to load and some will work right out of the box. There's also a manual install method. So when you are working with a plugin, like if we look at the source, for example, of this AVR architecture plugin, the plugin itself lives here on GitHub, for example, and I could just take that entire repository and clone it directly into my user plugins folder. If you check in the user documentation guide, docs.binary.ninja, it's also in your offline install under the help menu under user reference. The getting started guide will describe to you all of the paths for where your user folder is depending on your platform. And inside of my user folder is a plugin folder and I can manually put plugins there. You can see a couple here that we've been working on through earlier stream episodes. And this can take two forms. It could be just the raw plugin itself. You can see I've got a .so file and I've got a just a .py file directly. Or it could be a, a plugin that is actually like a full Python plugin with an init.py and other information. And both types of those will be loaded when you load Binary Ninja. The plugin manager itself uses the repositories folder. So you can actually look in there and see all of the plugins that I've installed using the, the repository manager. But you don't actually have to do that. Again, you can just do it directly from, from the UI to manage things. But if you ever want to go poking around in one of those or find a raw file, you can get it from there. Plugins can register themselves a couple different ways, and so sometimes they can just extend the UI and add new buttons, but most commonly are available via the Tools Plugins menu. Most of the default ways you would access them, or some of them will work on particular functions, and so you might right-click on a function and have a plugin that would take an action on that function versus just doing something generically across the whole binary. And of course, you can also use the Command Palette with Control p or Command p and then type the name of the function like snippets, for example, which let me write snippets of Python, but also has an editor that let me edit all of those snippets directly and trigger them either in the UI or, or via the command palette. So that covers most of the things you might want to know for a plugin when things are going well. But what if you have to deal with some troubleshooting? What if there's a bug in your plugin? Well, first you could use the log window, which I've got down here. You can make sure that's on by going under native docs and hide log or show log under the view menu. And you'll see, actually, I did have a problem. One of my plugins isn't compatible with my new API. So I could go rebuild that plugin or get the latest version. Native plugins have to have compatibility and we'll check in and warn before they even run with the current core architecture. So it keeps them from trying to call into an, an outdated API and, and crashing. You'll also see, I can see all the other plugins that were loaded through here. Any other Python plugins would have also come in here as well. So if you've got trouble though, let's go back to our user documentation. And there's a whole section on using and writing plugins that's going to talk about a lot of things I've just covered. You can even directly script up and automate installation via the plugin manager. This documentation on installing prerequisites is actually a little outdated because the latest version will automatically install prerequisites for you if the plugin is configured for it. So if a plugin has a requirements.txt, Binary Ninja will automatically install those requirements for you and it makes working with Python plugins a lot easier. The troubleshooting section here is as the last little bit I want to cover on using plugins, which is you might want to save off a log to submit to a plugin author and run with debug mode enabled. And if you just launch Binary Ninja on the command line with dash D and dash L, you can get yourself a log file, which might make it easier to troubleshoot things. And then there's two other tricks that you can do as well. If you've got just a general Binary Ninja problem and you suspect a plugin might be to blame, you can launch Binary Ninja with dash P uh, on the command line and it will disable all plugins and all architectures or you can set some environment variables and just disable user plugins and that will help kind of minimize uh, troubleshooting so one of the things you can do if you've got some weird behavior you want to report as a bug you can always just check and see if it's a plugin that you've you've installed that's it's caused it 
that's great for using plugins. They're really easy to use. A lot of the power of Binary Ninja comes through the API and many of the powerful plugins people have written. And what if you want to write one? If you want to write a plugin, what are some of the things that, that you should be aware of? Well, first, your plugin could be installed either the two ways that I just talked about. You might have a plugin that users install via the plugin manager, or you might have a plugin that users can just directly clone into their, into their plugin folder, either way. If you do want to have a plugin that's installed in the plugin manager, you've got a couple of requirements. They're, they're relatively straightforward, but if we look at one of these plugins, for example, the AVR architecture plugin, we'll see this key bit right here, this plugin.json file. So this JSON file defines some metadata that the plugin manager will use to show information about the plugin, determine if it's compatible with the version of Binary Ninja you have, give you all the description information. And that is generated actually by either a tool that you can use yourself or you can manually generate if you prefer. But there's this sample repository here called Release Helper, which includes this generate plugin info, which can quickly generate your JSON file for you. And as you're doing releases of your plugin, this utility may be very helpful. So there's a couple of examples right there. Because it is important that just when you commit to GitHub, it doesn't necessarily update the plugin in the plugin manager. What you actually have to do are releases. And this is really nice because you as a plugin developer don't have to worry about committing something that breaks, like only at sort of set stable points would you maybe want to create a release that would be installed in the plugin manager. And you can do that here. There used to be a process where you would let the Vector35 team know and file an issue. That That is all done at this point. Once you are already accepted into the plugin manager, all you have to do is cut in your release, we automatically detect it, and we'll update in the plugin manager at periodic intervals. And so that's really all it takes. You can use the do release tool to update, change the version information, tag the release, and that'll all happen automatically. One of the more common questions about writing a plugin is testing it. Like if I've got a plugin and I don't want to have to like reload Binary Ninja to test my changes and my plugin, can I do that in the UI? And the answer is maybe, it depends. So for example, this is a useful snippet in that writing plugin documentation that will let you reload a plugin and call some method from it again and again. So if you've got an editor up and you're changing your code, you can change it, test your plugin, and then you can rerun it by just hitting up enter in the Python console with a snippet like this. It's not, however, possible with a binary view or an architecture. Because these are initialized at load in Binary Ninja, you do have to restart Binary Ninja. In that case, if you do happen to have a commercial license, it can actually help a little bit because you can just have a headless standalone script that you're running that does something with the architecture and prints pronounce the results, and you can just rerun that script iteratively as you're developing out your architecture. But for all other plugins, uh, this little snippet makes it really easy to quickly iterate and test on it. In terms of best practices, the standard that you maintain for you know your kind of plugin style is up to you, and uh, we don't really have any kind of set guidelines there. We are, of course, have a pretty savvy user community, but the more you do in terms of documentation and screenshots, I think the more attractive it makes your plugin, and the more likely people are going to be to to run it. And so having a really nice description field that shows off what your plugin is capable of, I think is, is really helpful. So hopefully that is useful, whether you are a user who just wants to know how to find the latest and greatest plugins and use them, or whether you're interested in writing them. And as always, if you have any questions, contact us on support, our Slack. Twitter.